Hello, I'm Yvette Torres, and welcome to another edition of The Road to Recovery. Today we'll be talking about new trends and implication of research in the behavioral health field. Joining us in our panel today are Dr. H. Wesley Clark, Director, Center for Substance Abuse Treatment, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Rockville, Maryland. Dr. Jonathan Delman, Research Professor, University of Massachusetts, Department of Psychiatry, Worcester, Massachusetts. Dr. Marcus Heilig, Clinical Director, National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, National Institutes of Health, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Bethesda, Maryland. Dr. Ivan Montoya, Deputy Director, Division of Pharmacotherapies and Medical Consequences of Drug Abuse, National Institute on Drug Abuse, National Institute of Health, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Bethesda, Maryland. Dr. Clark, does the SAMHSA National Survey on Drug Use and Health influence in some way the research that is done in the country? It is our hope that the NISDA survey provides the uh, foundation, epidemiologic foundation, for uh, addressing key questions. And it does influence, as far as uh, we can determine, both uh, the uh, pharmacologic, medical, and psychological aspects of the research, as well as uh, individuals who are looking at systems research by quantifying the nature of the problem and providing um, data over time so that we can get a sense of how prevalent a substance use disorder might be in this country. Very good. And Dr. Montoya, in terms of the current research coming out of the two centers, both the National Institute of Health and NIAAA, um, how do they influence? I know you're with NIDA, but how do both of these uh, research mechanisms influence the addiction field? Yeah, that's uh, very important because both institutes, both uh, groups uh, feed into each other. Uh, the data that comes from uh, SAMHSA is very important for NIH to determine what are the public health priorities for research. And for us, for NIDA, we try to address those priorities and we try to support research that is tackling those research priorities. And that way we try to resolve to some extent the problems that have been raised in the research that is funded by SAMHSA. Very good. And Dr. Halig, you for about 18 months have been serving as the clinical director for both institutes. Do you want to talk a little bit about that change and why it came about? Well, I think it's increasingly recognized that the old dichotomy that was between alcohol users and illicit drug users is more and more muddled, that there's a large overlap in terms of the patient populations, but also there is an increasing realization that the neuro neurobiological mechanisms that different drugs of abuse play on are also overlapping. So it made a lot of sense for us to start working together and try to identify mechanisms that could be targeted by treatments in all kinds of addictive disorders. And how is that done um, in, in actuality? Well, let me give you a very specific example. So um, we know, for instance, one of the major advances of addiction science that I see over the past decade or so is the realization that stress mechanisms are extremely important in progression of addiction, in relapse, We've known for a long time that people relapse often when they have been exposed to some kind of social stressor, had a fight, been marginalized in their lives. So as we identify neurobiological systems that stress reactions are driven by, it makes sense for investigators both from the Alcohol Institute and the Drug Abuse Institute to team up around some kind of medication that potentially could you know, dampen those stress responses and through that decrease the risk for relapse. So we have one such consortium going on right now and it's been a wonderful ride. We learn a lot from each other and we hope through that to also accelerate 
how we can bring treatment. So there's collaborative uh, research done that both institute identify researchers and they're both working together. Mm -hmm. That's Absolutely. excellent. Absolutely. Excellent. Dr. Clark, one of SAMHSA's mission is to evaluate programs that are coming from the institutes and to further explore their viability in community settings. Is that correct? Well, it's not just uh, that. Uh, your point's well taken and we work uh, very uh, closely with the institutes. We have a blending initiative project uh, with the National Institute of Drug Abuse and uh, we work in, in, in close collaboration. But what we are also doing with what we call our National Registry of Effective uh, uh, Evidence-Based uh, Programs and Practice is to allow the community to generate uh, um, projects so that that, that uh, survive scrutiny through uh, uh, evidence-based uh, data um, research literature so that we can promote these practices so we can alter how people are practicing in the community. And wanted to stress that one of our emphasis is co-occurring disorders because while the research uh, may not be as um, uh, aggressive as we would like it to be, there are in the community many practitioners who realize that they have to deal with both problems. Uh, we do know, uh, as was previously pointed out, that if you've got a co-occurring uh, psychological issue uh, in addition to substance use, um, the chance of your uh, having that uh, co-occurring problem goes up. Very good. Dr. Heilig. I, well, I guess one of the most extreme examples of that that's very important to, to pay attention to now is PTSD, of course, where there's a tremendous focus on PTSD uh, among returning veterans. There's less so on the fact that in about half of the cases, these people develop substance use disorders, which tremendously increase the risk for suicide attempts, completed suicide, or even just impaired health in general. Dr. Delman, did you want to add something? I, I have received two NIMH grants as an investigator for conducting community-based participatory action research, which requires the researchers, including myself, to collaborate with the community, um, including peers, consumers, family members, um, providers, to really generate a good research question that will, that will ultimately turn into a, a study that, that will produce good results that is understandable to policymakers and the community. In, in Massachusetts, back in 2001 or so, we, we started a research project because young adults and parents felt like that their needs were not being met. So we got a small grant and, and trained the young adults to participate as researchers. They did some of the interviewing. And when they ultimately presented the results, and the results weren't great, um, to the Department of Mental Health, the Department of Mental Health made some changes. So, and that led to an NIMH grant to look at the housing preferences of young adults that's similarly co a collaborative method. So I'm appreciative as a mental health consumer that you know, I can lead a project, and this was prior to my having a PhD, which I have now. Dr. Montoya. I'd like to, to highlight an, an aspect of, about this uh, research uh, to practice and the importance of uh, people with disorders, people with substance abuse and alcohol seeking participation in clinical trials. I think uh, there's, that's a great opportunity to perhaps b get the best treatment that's still not available in, for the community, but eventually it's a treatment that will be tested and it may be very effective. So I'd like to encourage people to seek and try to participate in those uh, clinical trials of different medications or behavioral therapies mm -hmm. or combination of behavioral therapy and medications that maybe will be the only opportunity to get that type of treatment. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Harley, why should I, as a person uh, in the community that may have an addiction problem or my family, why should, I, uh, why should I be concerned with what happens in, in, in the research realm? Because only an informed consumer can, can demand to receive the right kind of services. There's a whole world of treatment providers out there that will happily sell you things that may cost a whole lot and not do a whole lot of good. And so I think research data that are, that are produced by our institutes at every level, from the epidemiology 
through what are the symptoms of an addictive disorder, uh, all the way to what are the evidence-based treatments, and perhaps even as important, what treatment may work for which individual, because we are in an age where we need to start realizing that people are not alike and we need to personalize treatments. Only those kinds of data can help. So, so there's a lot of hope. I think, th I think that's one underlying message that we should convey from here. There is a lot of good help to get, but you also need to know a whole lot in order to access the right kind of help. It's important to realize that you, the consumer plays a critical role in the uh, treatment process. Uh, you can't be solely professionally driven. So shared decision making, consumer participation, peer participation is essential. Dr. Delman. I, I've conducted research in the area of um, client involvement in medication decision making. And the research shows that a lot of psychiatrists resist um, client involvement for various reasons. Um, so it's very difficult, even if a client is educated, to kind of push his or her way in if um, a psychiatrist is saying no. Um, yet there are practices that where psychiatrists are successful at invol in involving people in their treatment. And that's because, according to my research, they show that they really care and they encourage people to participate. It's simply, what do you think? What do you think your diagnosis is? What medications do you want? And that is in itself an intervention. The other piece to this is that psychiatrists are successful in this area when they make themselves accessible um, outside office hours. Because a lot of these medications have side effects that take place outside the office and then people have real needs and they need to make a call. And, and when they make the call, if, if they know that there's someone going to be available, they're going to feel more involved in their treatment because then they feel like they can make changes in their medications that are at a certain point maybe harming them. Well, when we come back, I yes. want to delve a little bit more because I want to ask you about your own experience with your own um, progress in, in, in your journey. We'll be right back. SAMHSA has a strong partnership with uh, NIDA, with, uh, that's the National Institute of Drug Abuse, with NIAAA, which is the National Institute of Alcohol and Alcohol Abuse, and the National Institute of Mental Health. Those three institutes are charged with research about uh, those diseases and illnesses. And SAMHSA, of course, is the public health agency that works to get services and uh, changes out there about mental health systems and, and practices. We work closely with them because we want to take what they've learned and make sure it gets into practice. We uh, have some joint funding opportunities that we do. We work together on our addiction technology transfer centers and trying to make sure that people have the best information about the evidence-based practices that are emerging out of the research that the institutes do. At the same time, SAMHSA is actually testing some things in services that may ultimately be something that we want science behind. So we also have a services to science approach that we uh, try to do and learn about as we work out there with the programs that we fund. We evaluate all of our programs, whether they're contracts or grants or whatever that we do, to make sure that we have the best information possible for the country's systems and services. One of the most exciting developments in behavioral health is the recognition that health information technology can help facilitate prevention and recovery, prevention, treatment, and recovery from um, substance use and mental health uh, issues. The electronic health records can facilitate integration of care with primary care, so people who have behavioral health issues and physical health issues can have their issues addressed in an integrated fa fashion with the primary care environment, being aware of some of the uh, critical issues in the behavioral health environment, like what medication a person might be on or what unique adverse issues that uh, might surface that they and share information back and forth seamlessly. Uh, health information technology promises the use of uh, uh, individual recovery strategies so that people can enhance their strength, they can assess their emotional state, they can assess their recovery and provide that information back 
through uh, smartphones and websites to their counselors or treatment providers uh, or to their primary care practitioner, depending upon the situation. Every day, I seek a positive direction for my life. Through my accomplishments. And now, with help. And support from my family and others, I own. I own. I own my recovery from addiction and depression. Join, Join the Voices, Voices for recovery. recovery. It's, it's worth, worth it. it. For information on mental and substance use disorders, including prevention and treatment referral, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And the biggest thing for me is I'm a policy wonk in terms of I want to make changes. I, I want to work with people, and I believe it's a collaboration, to, to improve the system. I had been in the mental health system, and there were a lot of flaws. And I think everybody's acknowledged it now. Um, but my feeling about change is you work with a group of people to really build momentum and then share research findings. Dr. Clark, you wanted to add something from our last panel. Yes, I wanted to stress that it is really important for us to keep in mind that in health in general, it really is important to involve the people who are coming to the delivery system for assistance. Patient compliance, adherence, however you want to characterize it, applies not just to behavioral health issues, not just to mental health, not just to substance use issues, but for diabetes, hypertension, congestive heart failure, asthma, if the individual who is supposed to receive the medication doesn't like it, is having adverse effects associated with it, can't manage the regimen associated with it, then they won't comply, they won't take the medication as scheduled, and it will be very difficult for the professional, quote unquote, to know what's going on. With shared decision making and uh, patient participation in, in the outcome, then what you get is a better chance to collect uh, basic information necessary to determine whether the intervention is appropriate or not. And Dr. Heilig, there are systems of checks and balances to oversee the care that is given to individuals who are participating in a research modality. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's uh, really an important balance to strike. We need to protect vulnerable individuals. At the same time, it's in the interest of that same group that new treatments are brought forward. So we're constantly thinking about how can we assure, you know, the respect for our subjects, their safety and all that, while at the same time moving forward with the research as fast as possible. We work together. So to your left, you have the chair of the Institutional Review Board of for Addiction Research at the National Institutes of Health, Ivan Montoya, works as the chair of, of that panel. I, as clinical director, have many discussions with him. And um, we really try to strike that balance. Tell us a little bit about that, Ivan. As Marcus said, it, I'm the chair of the Institutional Review Board for both NIDA and NIAAA, the intramural programs of both institutes. And our mission is to try to advance the science while protecting the subjects that are participating in clinical research. So it's the, the protection of human subjects is the, of paramount importance for not only NIH, but in the department, but in general, all the entities that do clinical research. So our mission is to try to evaluate the research that is brought to us and make sure that all the protections and all the check and balances are in place and making sure that all the subjects are protected and the science is good science because the, we don't want to have a lot of protection for a project that is not going to have any future. So Dr. Delman, yes. you mentioned that you're a consumer. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience? I can. I, um, I think I had depression from a very young age, um, but my um, focus on achievement kept me going through law school and into a few jobs that I would lose very quickly until I ended up um, in, um, with nothing, without, a, without work, without a place to live, although my parents put me up, um, and hospitalized when I was at age 30. 
which is a very strange experience um, for someone who's not been in hospitals. But um, that got me started. I, I essentially said to myself, something's not working right with me. I mean, something about what I'm doing is not working. So I, I sort of gave myself over to the system. And there were some good things about that, but the best thing is that I met a therapist who um, really took an interest in me and began to see me outside of the hospital. Twice, he said, I, he gave me conditions upon which he would see me, and I just accepted that, which is not easy for me. But I did because I believed in him, and I saw him twice a week for many years, and it was through that process that I learned that it wasn't just a brain, it isn't really a brain disease, it, it was a rehabilitative process, there was a responsibility that I had to take. And my path was through advocacy, getting involved in um, Empower in Massachusetts, and that led to a job, and without a job, I'm dysfunctional. With a job, I'm very functional. But I ultimately got this job running um, a peer-to-peer -peer evaluation team in Massachusetts. And through that, I met my wonderful wife, Deborah. And that happened about 13 years ago. And from there, um, I was already doing better. But the physical manifestations of my depression left. I was having night sweats. But once I got the job and, and got married, a lot of these physical symptoms were alleviating. And now you're conducting research. And now I, have, I got my PhD last year mm -hmm. and um, while working full time. So it, it's, re it's really been great. And I got a Robert Wood Johnson Leadership Award in 2008 Excellent. that provided me money for research. So um, it, it's really been remarkable. Quite a trajectory. Um, let's talk about specifically about research findings. What are we finding, for example, the major issues right now in the country uh, are with prescription misuse, opioids, etc. What is the, the current research uh, tell us? What things are in the pipeline that can address some of the issues that we're seeing around the country in terms of problematic areas? Dr. Harley. Well, I'm not an epidemiologist, but I think it's a well-established fact by now that prescription opiate abuse and, and addiction, painkillers, has become an epidemic. Uh, I believe I recall that the number of overdose deaths from those drugs now is twice that of cocaine and other illicit drugs combined. Um, so it's clearly a very important issue. That many of the measures that need to be taken are regulatory, and I don't necessarily think that a neuroscientist is the best person to, to speak to them. But there are issues that neuroscience can do here as well. So one of them is to identify the early signs of vulnerability to developing addiction. Many of prescription opiate users may have been given prescription opiates initially for a legitimate indication. And uh, so we need to be very observant to notice the signs of that legitimate use progressing into an addictive process. We know, in fact, some of those signs, and we need to educate pro treatment providers and the public. Um, there are pharmacological mechanisms that are being studied, uh, which perhaps might reduce the potential for addiction developing when such as, are you able to, to well, speak so for, to some so of So we're right now starting up one, one study where we believe that if, for instance, uh, uh, painkillers like, such as oxycodone or, or that class of drugs were combined with another medication, one of the anti-stress medications that we're studying, the risk of addiction developing would probably be reduced and perhaps even that kind of medication could be treated in the early stages of, of that kind of addiction. Thank you, Dr. Clark. Right, I wanted to uh, point out uh, the Arnisa studies show that we have uh, roughly six million people who are misusing uh, prescription uh, uh, drugs, and that's roughly 2.4 percent of the population, and, and that number uh, is uh, striking. But the other issue is that we know that roughly 55 percent of, from Arnisa study, 55 percent of the people who misuse 
uh, prescription uh, drugs, uh, get them free from friends and family. So I always want to throw in that we need to make sure we educate consumers as well as uh, the family, as well as the larger community. And I'll let our researchers talk about the research agenda, but the, the key construct is that this problem goes beyond uh, pain management because it, it enters into the realm of, well, what do I do with my extra pills? And we have some practical solutions which are not research driven. The DEA has a take back program. Um, we work collaboratively with NIDA, FDA, and the DEA to make sure that we educate the public uh, about the misuse of prescription opioids or prescription drugs in general, because without that, people will continue to give uh, their prescriptions to uh, friends and family, and it'll be hard to deal with the overdose consequences. So that augurs for really uh, individuals to keep track of their medication, to secure them, and not leave right. them in their unattended right. in their medicine cabinet. Yes. which is the first place I think, right, Ivan? We're yeah, I, I think the, the problem of uh, prescription opioid abuse or dependence is, uh, is, is very complex and it requires a multi-pronged approach. Not one approach is going to be for everybody. I just want to uh, expand a little bit of what Marcus was saying about one of the approaches is maybe improving the type of pr prescription opioids. Opioids are excellent analgesics, but in the, in the wrong hands it can be very dangerous. So one of the things that NIDA is doing is trying to develop what is called abuse deterrent formulation. So formulations of prescription opiates who are very good analgesics, but will, people will be less likely to become dependent on them. I'm going to come back to you so you can really explain to us how that works and what people need to be aware of. We'll be right back. For more information on National Recovery Month, to find out how to get involved, or to locate an event near you, visit the Recovery Month website at recoverymonth.gov. Before, addiction and depression kept me from living my life. Now, every step I take in recovery benefits everyone. For information and treatment referral for you or someone you love, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. The mission of the American Society of Addiction Medicine has five key components. One is to promote access to quality addiction treatment services for patients. The second is to educate physicians and other providers as well as the public about addiction. Third is to support prevention and research. Next is to promote the role of the physician in treating patients with addiction. And lastly, is to establish addiction medicine as a recognized medical specialty, recognized by health insurers, the public, and other professional organizations. So 16 milligrams. I found out about ASAM in the 1980s. I was working with teenagers who had significant behavioral problems. And what ended up happening was I had not been trained to take care of severe substance use issues in the adolescent population. So I had the opportunity to start taking classes and started going into ASAM courses and uh, realized that there was an entire population of doctors who were dedicated to this field. What's really interesting with addiction doctors is that many of them have been touched by this disease in some way and they're motivated to help make it better. We get doctors calling us every day saying they're seeing a lot of patients that have prescription drug issues and they don't know how to refer them to treatment, how to address their treatment. And so that's one area where we're really trying to provide more educational resources for people. The ASEM criteria is really the best guidelines for placing people with addiction and co-occurring disorders. And this book is really essential to addiction care across the nation. Its recommendations are required in over 25 states. We have our journal, the Journal of Addiction Medicine. We have our weekly communication tool, ASAM Weekly. We have our bi-monthly ASAM Magazine. We have our educational programs, our medical scientific conference that's held annually conference really allows physicians and researchers to present the latest information, the latest research on addiction treatments and the most effective treatments that are available. 
So we use multiple vehicles, whether they are written, electronic, or live, to get this information out to, to our members and others. Things change so quickly in medicine. If you don't keep up with it on almost a daily basis, you're going to be left behind. And you just can't afford to be left behind and provide the kind of patient care I want to provide. And then there's sort of the intangible benefits, if you will, the, the networking, the being part of the addiction um, medicine community. Being able to call up and just say, I got the situation, I'm, I, I, I've got to talk to you about this, I'm not sure about what to do in this situation. And I've sought out consultations with ASAM members in terms of particularly difficult cases that I have, and they've all been highly receptive to help, helping me out. By joining ASAM, you are really putting your weight and support behind a group of organized individuals who are going to ultimately improve the care for anyone who is suffering from addiction. Dr. Montoya, you were saying. See, I was talking about uh, what is called abuse deterrent formulations. Those are formulations of opiates that are le have less ability to cause addiction. So it's different types of formulations or uh, chemical structures that will prevent people from becoming addicted. In some cases, also, there are new medications that are being investigated for as analgesics who are not necessarily opiates. And there are also some combinations of opiate analgesics with abuse of other medications that prevent uh, addiction. That is the, the, the way of approaching this problem. So it's, pharmacologically, there are many possibilities. Now, I also want to mention that a very important area of research is looking at ways of treating overdose. And if folks wanted to find out where they could get more information related to these studies. NIH uh, has a website, it's called Reporter, and at that website you can basically look at any information of, around m m studies that are being funded by, by NIH for those uh, disorders. Excellent. Dr. Heilig, you wanted to add something about what Dr. Delman had commented on earlier. Yes, well, I, so I was struck you gave such a wonderful description of how much it takes of a holistic view of a person to overcome mental problems, addictive problems, it's the same thing. But then you made this distinction, well, it's not just a brain disease. And I was thinking, we, we used to have this debate, you know, is it, is it psychological or is it in the brain? And of course, modern neuroscience does not acknowledge any such distinction. It all plays out in the brain. And one of the most exciting and probably important developments lately is uh, begin our beginning of an understanding of how social interplay relationships are encoded in the brain, how that processing becomes disrupted as people develop mental disorders or addictive disorders. Just to give an example, being socially excluded is on one hand a reality that many, if not all of our patients struggle with in their day-to-day -day lives. It's also something that you can see in the fMRI camera and it so happens that when you've had alcoholism for an extended period of time, a recent research report just showed your response to the stress of being socially excluded is, is almost doubled. So that kind of illustrates, it's just two different ways of viewing the same processes. One, one of the ways, maybe the main way my depression manifested itself was in isolation. Yeah. I'm ultimately really kind of a, 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 um, a, a person who, who is an introvert. So that, that part is normal. But early on in my life, I, I just started to shoot people away. I don't know why. I had a terrible, I, I thought I was disgusting and gross. I don't know why. I had probably had some abuse, trauma, um, that didn't help that. And I just wanted to add that trauma is a, 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 a real connection between substance abuse and mental health. Um, but just going back to me, um, what really helped me ultimately, as I mentioned before, was getting involved in a group. And because I needed a group that would meet my needs. Because I know I'm not gonna go to a party and, and, and have a great time. <laughs> my kind of group is a group that works. So I got searched for an advocacy group, and at that point, Empower in Massachusetts, which is a parent organization, um, was really doing a lot of great work with the Medicaid authority there in addressing some serious issues. And I got involved, and in, with my knowledge, I kind of got put in the front lines and began meeting with commissioners and various people. And that automatically not only um, 
makes you part of something, but makes you feel like you have value. And contributing. It, it, yeah, I mean, it was really two things. The, the, the support of my peers, and in my case, it's not researchers, it's people with mental illness. That's who I'm most comfortable with. Um, it was extremely important, and that's how I met my wife. <laughs> what was she, she was the director of Empower, and um, um, it took a few years, <laughs> But um, So would you, Dr. Delman, encourage people that have a mental health problem to really seek at least a group dynamic at the beginning and then to, to look for, for additional avenues if necessary in order to get reintegrated and to seek help? Yes. I mean, through, through, by joining a group, I had an opportunity to demonstrate my skills and abilities and it led to a job. Now, not everybody's so job focused as I am, but you, you can demonstrate value at a, um, in another peer group and demonstrate yourself to be a great fe peer facilitator or just a nice person and you're mm -hmm. contributing to the group. Mm -hmm. a and it, we all have our different aims and um, we need to find the group that will, will, will meet It'll our work needs. For you. Thank you. And one, of, one of the things that we know uh, about the recovery mm -hmm. process, whether it is principally for mental a recovery from mental illness or from substance abuse, the, the 12 step programs also embrace this notion. And I think Dr. Heilig's uh, reference to stress as a, uh, a phenomenon associated with relapse and, and, a, and something that interferes with recovery. Uh, what we find from uh, the research is indeed the group dynamic uh, reduces stress. And then and with that reduction in stress, it's uh, a lot easier for the individual to cope, to be able to express what's going on with them, to be able to negotiate with the delivery system, including the professionals, uh, and to promote that uh, functional working relationship with their families and uh, uh, the, the larger society. So the key issue is in both the principally uh, addiction-oriented uh, uh, peer groups or the principally uh, mental illness-oriented peer groups, the key construct is having this network of individuals who is, uh, has been pointed out who can relate to you based on their shared experience or their similar experience and then can communicate that and, and also buy into the notion that recovery is necessary and recovery is possible. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to get into the whole notion of now that, that we've mentioned about the mental health versus the addiction, uh, the whole uh, approach to the Affordable Care Act is to provide an integration of both mental health and addiction services. I'm going to ask you in terms of how SAMHSA is dealing with that and then I'm going to go to each one of you mm -hmm. to ask you how it's being manifested or how uh, the researchers are thinking about how that will play out in, in the research world once it takes effect. Dr. Clark. Well, the most important thing is, uh, is an outgrowth of what Dr. Delman said and that is the individual who has the issue is able to recover from that issue. And what we hope from the Affordable Care Act, since it does require among the uh, essential health benefits, mental health and substance use disorder uh, treatment, behavioral health treatment, is that uh, we have a prevention and recovery oriented strategy uh, in the uh, various uh, provider networks associated with the Affordable Care Act. And that is uh, essential. You gotta have consumers involved and you've got to have ultimately a recovery oriented strategy which means that it's a full spectrum of issues if someone needs acute intervention that's offered if someone needs psycho uh, social uh, treatment that's offered rehabilitation whether it's housing or employment needs to be a part of uh, that spectrum and physical health issues as was pointed out the dichotomy between mind body uh, is a false dichotomy and we want to make sure that people are physically healthy as well as mentally and uh, healthy which includes both mental illness and, and, and substance use disorders we can facilitate that with the participation of consumers, then we've achieved our goal and objective and we will save money and save lives. And Dr. Harley, I suspect that at some point um, NIAAA has indeed done work on co-occurring conditions at some point or have we not gotten there yet? So it's a big challenge. It if is. you um, want to carry out research that ends up being published in the premier scientific journals, 
the notion is usually you focus as narrowly as you can. I often get in trouble. We have this philosophy, you know, one third of the patients we admit to our research unit with a diagnosis of alcohol dependence also have PTSD, for instance. Um, if you try to run a drug study, many people who assess your scientific work will say, well, why don't you study pure alcoholics if alcoholism is what you're interested in? And my response to that is, well, that's not what the clinical realities on the ground look like. But, so, so, but there's a long-standing tradition of, of science trying to isolate. You know, there are the splitters and the lumpers, and science belongs to the splitters. Mm -hmm. Uh, we need to get away from that on one hand, but on the other hand, we cannot underestimate the, the challenges that are inherent in that. It's, it's very complicated. So I don't have an answer, but we certainly need to start by recognizing how often those problems are co-occurring, by recognizing how often they play on the same brain circuitry. So for instance, drug cravings probably in many cases play on the same brain circuitry as does anxiety and, and low mood. Um, and so ultimately, hopefully, we can reassemble this. When we come back, I'd like to follow up on those issues with you. We'll be right back. I felt broken. I needed help for my addiction and depression. And with the help of my family and recovery support community, I am whole again. Join, Join the Voices, Voices for recovery. recovery. It's, it's worth, worth it. it. For information on prevention and treatment referral, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. The mission of the Institute for Family Health is to take care of a broad range of people's health care needs, especially targeted to people who have difficulty accessing services in the sort of mainstream medical establishment. We integrate behavioral health, primary care, specialty services, diabetes care, um, nutrition care, you know, really anything that the patient could possibly meet, need, we do our best to have in one place. Uh, it's kind of like one-stop shopping. If you have a problem with, with the medication, if you have a problem with, with, with uh, the insurance, they'll help you right there. Um, if, the, if, if, if you have depression or bipolar, you know, you speak to the doctor, you go to the third floor, and you see a therapist. People really want to come to one place and they want people to collaborate and communicate with them and um, about their care and they want to be a part of the process. We've really begun to see mental health and behavioral health services as an integral part of the system of care that we need to deliver for our patients. I really uh, appreciate everything that my primary care physician did, you know, to get me back on path as far as like the primary care. She made me realize how important it was to take care of myself both mentally and physically. In all cases, seeing people as one integrated human being helps to make them feel healthier and function better. We have the family practice co-located with the mental health services and we're moving forward in, in integrating the services much more. We're able to receive patients right from the doctor. Um, we're also able to go in the room with the patient and be able to co-treat. We have time where the, the family practitioners and the psychiatrists will consult with each other about cases, we have care teams, which consist of the mental health clinicians, the medical team. There's a constant communication within the electronic health record. So if you go see the doctor in 16th Street, and then you have to see a therapist in the Bronx, all your information is in the computer. Everything is right there, you know, and um, they'll still ask you questions, but at least they'll know 
Western history. We're able to refer, we're able to communicate with one another, we're able to look at patients' frequency, how they're doing in their health care. Oh, I always believe that it takes a village and so to involve the community and to involve patients and our providers. Um, and we do that a lot through some of our portals in our electronic health record system, allowing patients to have access through my chart. Um, we have a portal for community providers so that we can really share information. We're a federally qualified health center. We have always been open to seeing everybody regardless of their ability to pay. I think now with the Affordable Care Act and everything that's coming we're really at the cutting edge of, of pioneering those practices. I mean, it's immeasurable right now as a patient for how grateful and how thankful that I am for this environment. As a clinician, it's exciting to have a patient come in and say they're feeling better, they're doing better. Uh, but for me, you know, to have something concrete can also be really rewarding. So I like to see maybe the PHQ-9, the depression scores go down. And when they have co-occurring disorders, it's especially exciting to see like their medical, you know, tests and labs improving as well. That really, I think, exemplifies what we're trying to do as the Institute for Family Health, working together in all of our disciplines to improve the patient's outcomes. Dr. Heilig, you were saying? Well, so, you know, clinical research moves relatively slowly compared to the needs of the patients. But having said that, I would like to say that the intramural programs are the place where, you can, where we can move things quickly. Uh, there's a, in the university world, there's the whole process of writing a grant, getting it reviewed, revising it a couple of times, it takes a lot of time. The reason the, that the U.S. taxpayers invest about 10% of the NIH budget into an intramural program is that that is a place where we can pick up ideas and run with them basically overnight. So basically what that means is that you do conduct the research internal within the campus of NIH. We do. And one of the things about shared dialogue, though, I'd like to point out is that what SAMHSA can do is use the uh, products of uh, both the intramural and extramural uh, programs and to help populate uh, the, the practitioner community by insisting that they use these, the evidence-based strategies that the NIH uh, has developed so that we can facilitate early adoption of some of these strategies. Yeah, I'd like to please um, speak to collaboration, because that's going to be the backbone of the Affordable Care Act. Teams, medical homes, um, can people from different professions work together? I, I have found that in generally it's difficult for people to work in teams. And I think that really has to be part of the research process, is how people communicate, um, collaborate, whether it be as researchers or, or as practice teams. So we have a, a grant in Massachusetts called the Brass Tax Initiative out of SAMHSA, bringing recovery to scale. And I'm the coordinator, and we have people from the addictions community and mental health communities working together in, in, tr in trying to promote peers as agents of recovery in the new healthcare systems. What's really interesting to me about this is as a mental health peer, I've had good relations with um, peop people in addictions recovery for a while. So we were able to really get into this grant and work as peers across the fields to identify some of the dividing points, um, some of the definition of recovery, what's the role of a peer, but at the same time accept or acknowledge the differences. You have to acknowledge differences and then dialogue. And dialogue is, is not about judgment, it, 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 it's about just listening. And then the next step is process. And finally, you have to accept. So, you know, so we, we, we just talk and we accept that there are differences and yet we see the commonalities around trauma, around co-occurring disorders. And, and we're building a, a team that works together in order to impact um, how recovery-oriented care in Massachusetts is delivered. And you're, pro you're keeping track of the progress and, and that will be documented back to SAMHSA Absolutely. for further yeah, we have analysis. A report coming Very out. good. We, have, we actually have a report on, on peers working together coming out. Very good. Very good, Dr. Delman. Dr. Montoya, um, Dr. Heilig mentioned what they're doing. What is NIDA is, uh, uh, doing as well in terms of making the system more nimble? Yeah, I think we, we ha have a wonderful working relationship with NIAAA and with SAMHSA. That's, and 
to some extent also to an IMH, all those agencies in the government that are dealing with uh, alcohol, substance abuse, and mental disorders. So I think N NIDA is very invested in trying to address the issues of comorbidities, especially alcohol and substance abuse, and substance abuse and other mental disorders. So I think we, we, we have, we have a, a lot of progress right now in that, in that area. Very good. Dr. Clark, you wanted to mention the role of um, health information technology. Yes, uh, as the ACA evolves, one of the, the, the medium of exchanging information that will help uh, consumers, the research community, and providers is making sure that information flows uh, uh, between practitioners, between providing or provider organizations. And with electronic health records, with health information technology beyond electronic health records, we'll be able to make uh, good use of medical apps so that, and personal health records so that individuals can assume uh, greater control of the information that's shared about themselves and have a better understanding of what's going on with themselves. And I also like to remind us all that when we talk about substance abuse, we're also talking about tobacco and we're working uh, closely with Food and Drug Administration and its new powers so that we can deal with uh, uh, nicotine addiction, cigarette smoking, cigar smoking, and all of the ranges of nicotine consumption, which uh, uh, also kill people. I'm going to ask you a question, and then I want the rest of the panel also to address this question. In, I go back to the crystal ball. In your crystal ball, what can be done to really continue to improve the whole issue of research to practice? There's been a lot that has been written that physicians, for example, don't adopt. It used to be, five, it used to take them 10 years and then it was down to five years. And that's an issue in our, in our field. Um, in terms of you yourself have had an experience with health information technology and the strategic initiative at SAMHSA. That takes on new adoption of new approaches to handling the data and handling the information for the patients, et cetera. In your view, what can we do better in order to, to make that happen? Or are we doing already doing it? <clears throat> well, we are working with uh, NIDA and NIAAA and NIMH. We have a blending initiative that NIDA has championed and SAMHSA is collaborating with NIDA on that. We're working with the Office of the National Drug Control uh, Policy, uh, which is coordinating some of our discussions about health information technology. We're working with the Office of the National Coordinator of Health Information Technology so that that we can foster uh, the sharing of information between primary care, specialty care, which includes mental health and, and substance abuse. We need to continue to do that with what I call alacrity and dispatch. And uh, I think the commitment of the administration is to pursue that. Uh, integrated strategies, which also deal with the key components of a person's condition, uh, as well as involving that person, are the things that will make the ACA uh, viable, but will also enhance our ability to address uh, the concerns of uh, the individual, that individual's family and the community at large. Very good. Dr. Holly. I think the key driver for adopting evidence-based methods is the educated consumer. There are so many disincentives for people to pick up uh, what comes out of research. And I think the number one disincentive is just it's hard to change your practice and it's hard to get away from the dogmas you grew up with. And, you know, we, we can talk all we want about the need to come to work every morning and be ready to change the way we practice medicine because that's what evidence-based medicine really expects of us. It doesn't happen that way. But it, something very different happens. And what is, what is the, 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 the crux of it? It's just that I'm, a, I'm used to doing something. If I'm a, a psychiatrist or a physician, I'm used to doing something and, and I don't want to get out of my comfort zone. I think that's a big part of it. There's a lot of dogma. In particular, unfortunately, in substance use disorders, there's a lot of preconceived notion. I mean, there was a time when I would have patients who had co-occurring co -occurring depression and alcohol addiction, I would finally successfully get their depression treated and then they would go out into the culture of the 12-step tradition, which in those days, in many cases, meant they were told by their peers, you, you have to stop this because... Oh, the medication. So, so the, because the medications that affect your brain is not something you're supposed to be using. We've thankfully moved away from that to a large extent 
Why did we move away from it? Because we got better and better educated consumers. And so I, I think as the users become better educated, then they will provide the, the, the drivers for the practitioners to change Absolutely. the practice. You need to have an educated patient. The, the success of many areas, like in depression, for example, is because the patients with depression are educated about the importance of the medication, the effects, the side effects, indications, contraindications, and so on. So if we have that in substance abuse, that will be one very big step. The second is the healthcare providers. We still have a lot of stigma among healthcare providers that medications are not good or that you are treating a, an addiction with another addiction. That is totally untrue. The, 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 there are medications that can help people to stop craving, stop their withdrawal, and eventually put them in the path of recovery. And, and the third is the science. We have to have better science because we don't have good science. The doctors are not going to believe on us. The patients are not going to believe on us. So if we have good science, we can tell them this works and this is the path to, go to, to get your treatment. Thank you, and Dr. Delman. Most of my work is actually around the role of consumers, clients, and um, enhancing the research process. So I'd like to say two things in terms of the, an educated consumer. It's very difficult, from my experience, to walk into an office and say, gee, doc, um, you know, I should be off this med, you know, and, and because it doesn't meet my needs. Whether there's evidence to support that is a hard thing to say, but, you know, I've, I've had doctors drop me because I was, uh, didn't have insight into my mental illness, which I did. But, um, so that's hard. But as a collective, the consumer movement in mental health has been successful in bringing recovery-oriented care ideas, the idea of reducing seclusion and restraint, um, more trauma-informed care, and SAMHSA has been a good partner to the consumer movement in this case. So it's through policies that push down into practice. I'm not sure we're in practice yet, but um, so the collective consumer movement, or any movement, can, can be successful. You know, you mentioned something very critical, which is all of you have mentioned the role of the consumer, the role of the person that has the addiction problem or that has the mental health problem. Uh, and for that, we encourage everyone to participate in National Recovery Month every September. And they can go to our website at recoverymonth.gov to get more information on how indeed everyone that has a problem or that is in recovery or a family member can put together events, activities, and educate the public about all the issues that we've talked about today. Thank you for being here. It was a very, very Thank you good show. For a copy of this program or other programs in the Road to Recovery series, call SAMHSA at 1-800-662-HELP or order online at recoverymonth.gov and click on the Video Radio Web tab. Every September, National Recovery Month provides an opportunity for communities like yours to raise awareness of substance use and mental health problems, to highlight the effectiveness of treatment, and that people can and do recover. In order to help you plan events and activities in commemoration of this year's Recovery Month observance, the free online Recovery Month kit offers ideas, materials, and tools for planning, organizing, and realizing an event or outreach campaign that matches your goals and resources. To obtain an electronic copy of this year's Recovery Month kit and gain access to other free publications and materials related to recovery issues, visit the Recovery Month website at www.recoverymonth.gov or call 1-800-662-HELP.